is Wesley, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on managing identity and access across an enterprise. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'll be giving you real world scenarios of what could happen if um, you don't manage user identity and access. And I'll be giving you <clears throat> real world scenarios as well of uh, the benefits of managing identity and access. Uh, to begin with, to begin with, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I joined Jerio last year as a graduate. I'm currently a junior developer. I'm currently placed at the Life Healthcare uh, facilities. And then uh, prior to that, I was working as an intermediate security consultant at a private consulting company. And I was placed at Ryan Merchant Bank, where I was <clears throat> managing or running the identity and access management uh, tools. I joined the project at the end, or I, I joined the project at the end of the project, and then I was then placed there to do operations and support. Uh, throughout that whole, throughout that duration, um, I was managing some of their products. Um, I did the migrations, I updated the system and so forth. Moving on, so you might ask yourself, why, why might you need to manage identity and access? What is the reason? Why is it so important? And I wanna give you an example, as an, as an, as an organization gets bigger and bigger, it's only natural that there will be more employees joining and leaving the company and it's most likely that some of them or most of them will have access to the systems within the organization. This can include your HR system, your servers, your in-house systems, even projects that are currently running. And if nothing is done, you will have individuals that have already left the company, but they still have access to the systems. So, the accounts that they were using while they were still an active employee still have crucial access to the system. Um, throughout the presentation, I'll be using a story of Tabo. Tabo is a system administrator who has recently been dismissed at the company and it wasn't a pleasant dismissal. There was some violence that happened. A few words were said. And what do you think would happen if he gets home and he's still pissed? And it so happens he still has admin access to the payroll system and some of the other some of the other <clears throat> uh, system applications within the organization. He could decide to pay himself a three month salary just before you guys decide to remove the access or he can decide to delete some of the projects that you've been working on and all the time and effort that you're putting on the project could be lost in an instant. So um, what is an identity? Uh, if we look at it from an IT perspective. So an identity, uh, the definition is simply put as a digital ID uh, that is used to verify who you are online in a secure manner to safeguard your information. And these identities are, is what you use to log on to systems. This can vary from your Active Directory username, your email account, your employee number. Some system can even go as far as to use your ID number to identify you as an individual. And what then happens is a user like Tabo has 10 applications within the organization and each application identifies them differently with these different accounts. And if you were to pull a report on the user table, it will identify this person as five different people given that uh, we, we need to use a unique number. So uh, it will be very difficult to tie all these uh, access to one individual. Uh, I'll then explain later on on <clears throat> the the things you need to start asking, right? So <clears throat> going forward, when you need you need to manage when you're managing identity and access, you need to start asking questions like, what access does the user have? So if 
an audit an auditor was to come up and say can you pull us a report on all the access that Tabo has would you be able to answer those questions going forward the next question would would be who or how was this access granted is there a ticket request who approved it can we prove that whatever access that Tabo has currently was it approved how is it uh, how was it requested and so forth uh, the next question is to ask, does the user have appropriate access? As I mentioned earlier, Tabo is, an, is a system administrator. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't make sense if we find out that Tabo has read-only access on a database. It would make his job inappropriate or it would make his job difficult uh, if he only has read-only access. So these are the type of questions you also need to ask. Uh, it can also be vice versa if a normal user has admin access, uh, it can result to potential data loss when the user decides to fiddle with the data. Uh, <clears throat> you can also start asking questions like, uh, is the company uh, complying with the internal and external security guidelines? And then you can decide to ask, step up the question and also ask, how do you currently onboard new employees, contractors? Uh, what is the process uh, when when you're adding new users? Is it is it a difficult process, or is it a tedious, or is it a, a seamless process? And then, last but not least, other question you can start asking is how do you manage the complete, or how do you manage the complete identity lifecycle? So, from the moment a new employee joins the company to when they request access to when they leave. How is that process done? Uh, when the user decides to leave the company, how do you manage the removal of his or her access throughout the, the life cycle? So uh, dilemmas that come with securing, uh, securing access while ensuring compliance. Uh, when auditors come or when auditors come, do you have visibility to prove who has access to what? We must be able to prove that this person has these access and you must be confident in, um, in the report that you provide. And obviously, if they do find some redundancy, that will result in some audits coming through. And then you can then step up, also ask the questions, uh, where are the risks? Can you answer the questions, where are the risks? Uh, are there any privileged access? So privileged access is when uh, with Tavo's team, we can assume that he has five uh, other system administrators that he works with, and they have an account called super admin that they use to manage different servers. And Tavo, when he got fired and he decides to log in onto the server and he deletes some of the records on the database, it will be very difficult to know who exactly did or caused this incident because when you pull up the logs, it will say the super admin was the account that deleted these records. And it will be very difficult to know among the five members in Tavo's team who exactly did it. Uh, there are tools that can help you manage these issues. And then the other question is with security being uh, still sort of very new, uh, people are very difficult to adapting it. So the other question is, is business taking security very seriously? Moving on. Access policy control and enforcement. Uh, my GRC policy is being enforced. Uh, GRC being uh, general uh, risk assessment and compliance. Uh, you also need to start asking, is the company following or is it complying with any of the security rules that you have uh, enforced within the organization? Uh, are there any regulatory fines? Am I being exposed? So there's a lot of questions you need to start asking when managing identity. And then is there too, is there too much access? So earlier I mentioned if a normal user is assigned an admin account, uh, that would be too much access. Can you point out which accounts have too much access? Uh, moving on, uh, last but not least, access to request fulfillment uh, volume and compliance. 
So with most organizations, when a new user joined or joins or any existing members, uh, existing employees are at the company and they require access, they need to submit the request via the service portal or service desk. And with this process not being managed properly and also being manual, uh, it can result with the service desk, service desk having too many requests to comply and uh, the service desk people will be drowning in requests and it can very it can make it very difficult for them to do their regular jobs and it cannot also result in wrong or incomplete access it could happen a user might request for access for for five applications and miss one wrong or it could happen that they get too much access and it can result in having the wrong access and uh, <clears throat> you start asking questions like, why does bad access keep showing up? Uh, it's because you know, you're not managing the identity properly or you're not managing access properly. So there's a right way approach to implement this. There are tools that I'll then I'll mention later in the in, at the end of the presentation. So the right way to do it is. You should gather all the applications. Um, I've listed a few examples on the left of the page. So like your file shares, your HR systems, your directories, database and cloud access and so forth. And once you've gathered all these applications, you can now start pulling all the access that are currently existing on the systems. And then you should do system certifications. So system certifications is once you've put or gathered all the access we can then submit it to line managers to review if the, the direct reports have the correct access. So for example, with Tabo, his manager would be responsible for reviewing all his current access and the manager should be able to say, yes, Tabo should have admin access to the servers. No, Tabo should not have read-only access. And then they should start cleaning up the, this data. And then once this is done, uh, I'll show you uh, on the next page a uh, more better phase approach on how to do this. You can then start implementing a uh, simple access request. People can now request access on these platforms that help you manage identity and access. And, access. and then from there, you can start bringing in automated fulfillment. So when a new, when a new user joins the company, they, we know that there are five applications that everyone's use. For example, this would be your timesheet system. You can start bring, rolling in that. And then from there, we can have automated provisioning where users can request information. I mean, people can request access. And instead of it going to the service desk, it can go directly to the line managers for approval. And then you can also start bringing in uh, security and compliance controls. And once this whole part is done, we can now bring in role management, which I'll explain later in the next page. And then once you have those, you can also bring in the privilege access management as well, where you can manage shared accounts that make it very difficult you know, to put accountability since the accounts are shared across then, <clears throat> so the phased approach on how to do it properly is obviously is gathering all the access within the organization, uh, clean up the data, do access reviews, make sure that we know that this person should have this access or should not have this access. And once we have this information, we can start, you know, start uh, producing data that makes sense. Uh, for example, your joiner leavers movers. So I mentioned earlier, so when you have individuals that have left the company but still have access, you can now start pulling data that, that, that can indicate which users have left the company but still have access. And then uh, movers would be individuals that, let's say for example, they were developers, they had developer access and they decided to change their role and go to sales. It would be a risk for them to maintain their their, um, their, their IT access, because obviously as they move, uh, processes might change. I mean, if they come back and fiddle with something, it might become a risk and uh, potentially jeopardize a project. And then join, joiners would obviously be 
the people joining the company, you can also start knowing, okay, this person just joined and they might need the following uh, access. And then we have segregation of duties. So segregation of duties are, is when an individual has roles that shouldn't go together. So a simple good example is if Tabo has an admin access and then he has read only access, that's the segregation of duty in the sense of we don't know if Tabo is supposed to be a normal user or he's supposed to to have supposed to be an admin. So when you apply segregation of duties, you can start highlighting individuals that are uh, that are throwing flags, and then you can start fixing these issues uh, very simply. And then we we can also start implement, implementing your compliance controls. So your compliance controls can also be when people reset their password, we can uh, put policies that it, it must be at least 12 characters or eight characters, must, must have an uppercase and so forth. And then once you have this in place, we can then bring back the access requests where individuals can now request access. And since you've uh, apply these policies, a user cannot request an admin access and X and read only access. It will be flagged immediately. And then from there, you can now bring in the role management stuff that I mentioned earlier. So role management is, for example, we know, as I mentioned earlier, when a, when a new employee joins, joins the company, we know there are five applications that they use. The time uh, the timesheet system, the HR system, and um, and other three. And instead of requesting five access or five different applications, we can create a role called path right. And under this one role, we can have this. We can have all these five applications. This will make it easier, obviously, when assigning access, and also when the user leaves, you don't have to go through all the five applications to remove their access. You can just remove the one role and it will make it uh, very seamless to manage the access. And then from there, you can then tie back the provisioning and you can integrate it to your service desk and uh, start doing automated provisioning. So, <clears throat> what are the tools out there that can help you manage identity and access? Um, Cellpoint currently is the number one leader in, in, in managing identity and access. Uh, followed by Okta, which is one of the uh, small upcoming uh, technologies out there. What makes Okta very special is instead of cell, so cell point is very enterprise based and then Okta is for small companies. And Okta is trying to do identity access as a service. So you don't have to do all the deployments. Uh, the integrations are very easy, uh, very sort of drag and drop situations where at some point you might need to do some developing inside, you know, just to make sure it works properly. So this is in terms of managing identity and access. And then the previous access that I mentioned earlier, uh, there are tools out there that can help you. Uh, so with the super admin, with the super admin account I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very difficult to know who had the account when. With these tools, uh, a user can request the access and then it will be logged so that we know that at this point in time, Tabo was using this account and it can, very, it can make it very easy to put accountability in case something happens. Uh, that would be all for my presentation today. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Wesley, and thank you everyone for sticking with us. I do want to ask Wesley, just because obviously our questions are going into LinkedIn at the moment, I'd love to know from your side, if a company were to start on this journey and they had only limited amounts of these processes in place, what is the most important thing for them to start implementing to make sure that they are building this journey in a constructive way? Uh, I think the first thing to do would be knowing what you have currently. So pull in reports of everything you have, do an, assess do an assessment, know what potential risk you currently have. 
So yeah, before making any commitments to do a project or to buy a solution, um, you could end up buying a solution for an enterprise when you can get something that can be suitable for the amount of applications you have or for the amount of uh, employees within your organization. Mm. All right. I recommend that. That's awesome. And in your previous life, when you were still in the security space, what was the trickiest thing that you dealt with from a security perspective? Uh, there's a lot of data that comes in. Um, well, not knowing if you're still very new to it, the, the data can be, uh, when you look at it, it doesn't make sense. And obviously when you start knowing what to bring in, what to tie where, it can start coming together. Uh, the other second thing that was kind of difficult was sort of convincing or trying to show potential clients or uh, companies that this is a threat. Um, if if it's not if something if, if nothing is done, you know it can result in a lot of uh, accounts being compromised because they're no longer being managed. So some account some account could get brute forced or even guest accounts because. The, person, the passwords are no longer being rotated or stuff like that. Sure, that actually sounds terrifying. So last question before we move on. Will you personally be leaving WhatsApp? And if so, who are you joining or why are you staying? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay because there's a lot of, uh, most of my family members are still on WhatsApp. And obviously trying to convince them that uh, there's a lot of privacy potential uh, issues that might come with it in the future is a very difficult thing to convince. And obviously suggesting something new to them is not something that they're very open to. So I'll stay on WhatsApp a little bit longer. And if I'm going to move somewhere, I'm going to move on Telegram. Uh, simply because I've noticed there's a lot of communities on Telegram that are actually uh, useful. So, yeah. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Wesley. We really appreciate it. Everyone, we do apologize for our technical gremlins. If you have questions, please leave them in the LinkedIn comments. We will also be releasing these videos on YouTube, and we will also actively engage with your questions on that platform as well. So for those who missed us at the beginning, welcome. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. The next session and the next talk is actually focused and is one that has been focused on something quite important and something that's come and become more important in the time that we're in. And it actually comes from the space of mental health and our well-being and investing in taking care of ourselves. Thank you so much for your time, Jürgen. I am thrilled to pronounce and to well, introduce you to this one. So I'm going to send you live and I look forward to hearing all about your experience in burning the candle at both ends. Thank you, Anine. Thank you for the introduction. Um, for the people that don't know me, I'm Jürgen. Um, I'm a senior developer at Daryl now for, uh, I think, just way over three years. Um, and I'm going to be taking you through my presentation on my experience in burnout. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the saying that if you burn a candle from both ends, it simply won't last as long. Mental health is exactly like that. So in this presentation, I would like to highlight my personal experience, what risks are associated with burnout, what steps I took to heal uh, and find a greater balance and how I maintain uh, a healthy balance in my life. So without further ado, um, I was uh, basically in 2017, I was placed at a large client heading up a strategic project. Um, in the next slides, we'll just be looking at my priorities in my life and what I was doing um, that led to my burnout. And ultimately, you know, I was making big moves in life um, and everything seemed to be worth it uh, for the sacrifices. So in that year, uh, I was planning to get married uh, on the 10th of October. Uh, six months just prior to that, we had moved houses and uh, I was leading a major software project at the bank, which had uh, significant strategic value. 
Um, so a number of things obviously uh, went wrong as a result of doing just too many things at once. Um, so what it really had happened was, was a set of cascading events. And when it was obvious that we would miss the deadline of a project, we were put in a room, uh, a war room that was maybe four by four meters big. We were about six developers, two scrum masters, a product owner, and a couple of C-suite management folk that uh, would make use of this cramped space. Um, we held essentially two daily stand-ups, one where we explained to the executives what uh, progress had uh, taken place with the risk assessment, and the other one was essentially a technical uh, stand-up uh, where we would take stock and essentially run something like one to two day sprints depending on how complex the work was. And this was all to regain trust in uh, the project uh, and obviously with tremendous effort by everybody involved on the project. So we also um, had a problem with going live because our infrastructure that we required for our development environment and testing environment only was delivered about a month before going live which basically meant uh, our code had never really run inside the bank's e ecosystem. As a result, uh, we had to panel beat it a bit here and there to basically get us ready for go live. We ran benchmarks, things looked really good, and it was essentially go live of time. So QA passed, everything was signed off, and on go live, um, which was, I don't know, a Wednesday evening at around midnight, the files uh, from the mainframe started hitting our system and things quickly started processing. Things looked quite all right. Um, and we started breaking down the batches and sending out the documents. So we decided, cool, now let's log on via the terminal and just you know, make sure that things are right. And the error message we got basically stopped our hearts. The file system was locked completely. Uh, you could not read or write to it. And uh, fundamentally, we were doing IO operations. So what had happened was that the Linux security module had detected an anomaly and it suspended all processes of writing to the disk. Um, this was because of some poor configuration. But anyways, we quickly got an executive override to move over to the DR environment and to continue going live in that environment. After reconciling all of the data and starting the batches again, 20 minutes later, the same thing happened. Then uh, after some awkward phone calls, we got dispensation to go live on a UAT environment. Same thing happens as we log on, the system is already log locked. So all of us jump on a massive phone call and it turns out that the cluster that was hosting these VMs was not designed adequately and there was actually a unique bug in Linux's logical volume management that would attempt to auto provision more storage even if uh, there was no storage available. And what had happened is it managed to allocate more storage and by virtue of doing that, all the other VMs which touched that disk uh, would also lock. So essentially we brought down a good quarter of the bank. So you could imagine it was quite stressful, it was hectic. And with so many moving parts, it was hard to keep track. And only a, roughly about a week before um, uh, my wedding, I realized, oh shucks, um, on Saturday I'm getting, on Sunday I'm getting married. Um, fortunately, you know, we had been planning for a year, but with my attention being all over the place, um, my dear wife unfortunately did a lot of the work and uh, I just helped out where possible. But, you know, fortunately things started coming together and I had a great team to rely on in this time. But essentially, uh, it was a good month of spending 20 to 22 hour days working at the client site um, uh, for stretches of three, four days at a time um, with not very much sleep. Uh, it, it was really quite horrible. So that's basically everything started going wrong. And um, I had a bit of a breather in my life after things uh, started basically uh, stabilizing a bit. It's, it's funny, once you're, you take the pressure off of you, you can start focusing on yourself a bit and then 
I, I realized uh, through, first of all, uh, my epilepsy relapse that I was not doing so well, you know. Um, what essentially what happened was uh, because we were working these long hours, uh, I would not be taking my chronic medication because that had a side effect of making me sleepy, which was exactly the opposite of what we needed uh, to get things over the line. Um, next was, you know, erratic heart rate and blood pressure. So, you know, um, once, once I basically had time to think about myself a bit, I really felt terrible. I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Um, I constantly felt wired uh, and like I constantly had a rush of adrenaline. So I went to the doctor and, you know, he told me my heart rate is quite uh, all over the place and my blood pressure is high. And he immediately basically said, you know, you need to take some time off of work and gave me a whole bunch of different medication to lower my blood pressure, to essentially relax, etc. And that's all culminated in essentially me being unable to work for some time. I needed to really just decompress and stop. I was basically unable to uh, function. Um, and one of the ways I knew that I was really uh, going down a bad rabbit hole is I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't recognize who I was looking at. I had a big beard, my hair had gone significantly grayer and uh, it made me sad uh, to basically see that. Um, I mean, also one of the other days, um, around four o'clock in the morning at the client, we finished off uh, sorting out some other problem. I mean, these just issues happened all the time. Um, I left the office at about four. I got home. I thought, cool, I'm going to get some sleep. Everything is working. I took my uh, chronic medication, uh, passed out on the couch, and at 7 a.m. I got a phone call from uh, the scrum master saying, look, something's blown up again. I need to come in. And on the drive to work, the most peculiar thing had happened. First of all, obviously, I was a zombie uh, uh, on, on my medication. But while driving to the CBD, I noticed that suddenly everything in nature had become a lot greener and the sky was a lot clearer. And it dawned on me that I had completely missed the entire spring season, uh, the transition from winter to spring. Um, you know, who would have known that uh, so much time can fly so rapidly when you're focusing on something um, compulsively? So that was my rapid crash, essentially, with burnout. And uh, I'm now going to just talk quickly through burnout syndrome. It's essentially a, a, a mental disorder where you have, well, imploded completely. Uh, but we'll go through the risks and stages of that. So the risks associated with burnout uh, is obviously there's a lot of mental risks. So there's depression, which uh, have feelings of emptiness. Uh, some people have the propensity to be destructive uh, and self-destructive um, and have negative thoughts. So that uh, is also a huge risk factor. Neurologically, you can have a stroke or epilepsy. Um, you may uh, develop an eating disorder because you've been foregoing breakfast and lunch for six months and this is your new normal. So you sort of live to learn to live without uh, lunch. Um, if you are prone to, let's say, having a, a mental disorder or depression, things like that. Uh, working yourself to the bone definitely exacerbates that. So people with mood disorders uh, who are bipolar or schizophrenic, um, these, these massive events to your psyche can bring uh, that to the front. And obviously you can have a heart attack and then generally you're just fatigued, et cetera. I can go on and it's just, it's not a pretty picture. But there are essentially 12 stages of burnout that I would like to go through and pardon me for just going through the slides a bit quickly, is uh, there are 12 steps uh, on the road to burnout. Uh, and it is good to essentially evaluate yourself uh, against these 12 steps to see whether you are perhaps going down a dangerous hole. So the first one is the compulsion to prove yourself. So this is obviously, uh, and I'm sure a lot of junior developers or people who have just started at a company know exactly what this is all about. You have imposter syndrome and you want to demonstrate your work. 
So you work hard, you put in the extra hours, but the problem starts when you can't say no, right? And more work gets heaped on you. So you continue working harder. So you start going home after work, but you actually log on when the moment you come home or you don't even leave the office or you don't take leave for the Easter weekend with your family that everybody was so excited for. The next step, excuse me, is neglecting your needs. And, and that's sort of interwoven with the steps before is you disrupt your eating routine. So you may skip lunch, you might only run on coffee. You eventually start skipping showers or brushing your teeth. Um, and you neglect your social interactions. Um, I mean, there were times where I was so wired at work that um, my wife would speak to me and it literally just went over my head. And, you know, I was just like, yes, I hope you didn't ask me anything. Um, shame. And she was ex excellent through this process. But the next uh, step in uh, burnout is the displacement of conflict. So as you're going through this, starting to, your psyche is telling you, you are going against your values. But what you are doing is you're starting to rationalize these problems. You're starting to say, you know what, look, it's only two weeks of, of hell and, you know, I, I might get a nice bonus at the end of this, or I will take a month uh, long break to Bali or whatever. Uh, and you start feeling a little bit anxious because uh, you're not congruent um, with, with your id and your uh, ego, right? So eventually what happens is you revise your values. And this is now rewiring mentally. Uh, it is not just putting off lunch. This is basically saying, I do not need lunch to live. Um, or I basically, I, it doesn't matter if my daughter doesn't see me uh, every night or tonight. Um, and being completely fine with that, you know, you might say, oh, you know, I see her on weekends. It doesn't matter because I come home, he's in bed anywhere. For some people, that is a lifestyle. Personally, for me, I enjoy being around my daughter. And, and that's one of the things that uh, I have learned through my journey is that I really love my uh, family time and I've put a clear focus on it. But essentially, this is, you know, the negative spiraling of your revision of your values. Next is you start going into denial. Things are starting to fall apart. Your friends aren't talking to you. Um, you may uh, start getting a bit frustrated with people around you. Uh, you know, why isn't Joe working as hard as me? You know, is he lazy? Um, the people uh, or, or, you know, my colleague that know, you know, his job is not as important as mine. Uh, things like that. So you generally start becoming more antisocial and uh, denying that anything is actually wrong. So you're reinforcing this negative mindset for yourself. Next is social withdrawal. Uh, so obviously this has been happening already gradually, but you now basically so it's being no value in social life either anymore. You sleep, you wake up, you work. That is what makes you happy. Uh, not seeing your friends or family laugh or, or watching a movie. Uh, you know, seeing that uh, green dashboard or, or the file move from one end to another is, is what brings you joy and what releases dopamine in your head. Um, and you seclude yourself from people as a result. Then um, ultimately, because you've been reinforcing this mindset for quite a significant amount of time, you are starting to now uh, exhibit proper behavioral changes, not just, you know, oh, Jürgen is in a bad mood, he maybe, oh, maybe he's got a headache, or you, you start to embody the negative thoughts or, or the thoughts that you've been having. So you become this almost nice edge that just wants to deliver on a project. Um, you know, and your family and friends generally at this stage start to express concern because they can see your deterioration very obviously, right? The next sort of step, uh, and as I said, these are all sorts of interwoven, but psychologists have, basically to still these 12 steps or stages as sort of uh, phases that one can recognize. The next one is depersonalization. So you basically don't see yourself or as anybody else as valuable. 
you think you are just a resource uh, done to do a job and you start feeling quite helpless um, and you become a bit of a doormat. Um, you don't set goals for yourself. You sort of, how can I say, even though you might have a goal for your project, right, that you're working towards, you're not setting up personal goals or things like that. And you don't stand up for things in your personal life, uh, only for things that are work related. So for example, um, you might not talk to your family the whole day. Uh, only when something is loud in the house will you basically say, hey guys, can we please be quiet? I'm working. Uh, you won't, let's say, engage with your family in any other uh, fashion. And this all leads to a feeling of inner emptiness because you know you're not being fulfilled. Um, you know that work essentially is, is not really that meaningful. Um, I say that with a big asterisk. Um, you know, if you're writing software that deals with uh, dispensing medication and things like that, you know, you obviously have, cannot allow any errors. But, you know, if it's a, a little report system that nobody really uses, you know, you've got to be fair on yourself depending on what you're doing in life, right? But you understand that you're very empty inside. And this is the point that is um, very risky for a lot of people that uh, have the propensity to harm themselves. They may engage in destructive behavior such as drugs, self-harm, um, uh, withdrawal, things like that. And ultimately, this now leads to the state of depression. Um, you are now basically perceived as clinically depressed. If you were to go to your general practitioner and explain what you've been going through, your ICD-10 code would say clinical depression. All right. Uh, essentially, that means you will need to start engaging in uh, cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, perhaps there may be medicine to assist you at this stage, but there is help, right? Uh, there are specialists in their fields as well as the people around you that can help with depression. And then ultimately you hit burnout syndrome and that is now, it's an implosion of your body. You just cannot anymore. So this can basically be manifested as like a stroke, hallucinations, um, heart failure, jitters, essentially where you just cannot get out of the state. It's almost like, um, how can I explain? It's like you would drive to work and you had a panic attack in your car before you go into the office because you just you just can't anymore. Um, and I, I, I hit that uh, point after, you know, a, a couple of, well, essentially almost two months of being in this war room. So hopefully these steps can help you identify where you are on your own mental health journey. So I'm just going to quickly go over some of the basics that I used to get myself back. So obviously it started with me saying I'm not all right. And I essentially went to my doctor and he diagnosed all these things and um, basically had to go into uh, the basics, right? So what I did was I started scheduling my life, um, first of all, to make sure that I do the basics. Power, eat, sleep, spend time with family, meditate. But, you know, so you reset to basically ensure that, you know, you treat yourself as a basic human being and you ensure that you fulfill the basic needs as per Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, perhaps. So how do you do this? You've got to be vulnerable. You need to focus on yourself and you need to accept that things are not all right. And it's okay to accept that. It's not weakness. It's actually a huge strength. Uh, it's a huge step to accept you are not in the place you want to be um, and to want to improve yourself. The next is, you know, to rekindle your support system and talk to someone close. Uh, that might be your family practitioner because they know about all of your bumps and boils and you speak to them. This might be a close friend. It might also be somebody inside your organization that you feel comfortable with, you know. Um, the next thing that you should probably do once you've hit burnout is you need to take time. You need to forget about your external problems. At the moment, work is not important. Your health is. If you don't get your health back, you will have a heart attack, you will have a stroke, you you will prolong the inevitable, right? So take time off. Uh, we are all allocated uh, sick leave and 
annual leave and it is absolutely all right to take a mental day. Uh, obviously, you know, follow the rules in the HR guide, but take a day for yourself if you're overwhelmed. Um, and next, be kind to yourself. You know, going through this process, you might feel like you're quite a failure and or, or garbage, right? You need to accept that you're not in a good space, but you are a good person and you, your intention is to be a better person and you should focus on that. Uh, and finally, you know, set goals for yourself, small goals. So for me, for example, it was, as I said, I scheduled things in my life. Um, spend at least half an hour outside, uh, you know, uh, walking in nature each day. Uh, make sure that you uh, have a wholesome lunch, you know, and then you start building up on these things where you start actually focusing on hobbies again. Um, you know, where you say, okay, look, I used to love hiking, I don't have time, and you build up to it. You go on some shorter hikes and you build up. Um, and through that, you gain confidence in yourself again. And then ultimately is to find your uh, mantra and to live it, right? What will people say at your tombstone? Oh, he was always working. That's that's not great. That's not a great image for your family or, or a role model for your children. Uh, for me, I want my family to say he was so dedicated to his family. He gave his all. He, nurtured, he was nurturing. He taught me so many things. Uh, I had a lot of good uh, laughs and good times with him. Uh, but I don't want for one second in my eulogy uh, for work to be mentioned. And it's obviously like you win a Nobel Prize or something, but you know, that's it. So um, that's essentially how you reset your routine into some of the basics. And that's what I've done. And ultimately you do this through some tools like reflect them. So, you know, you consider the people that you used to spend time with. Do you want to be friends with them again? Build up those relationships. You know, family obligations, are there, you can't get around them, but you can actively participate and uh, be a member of the family, or you can choose to just not be, right? And consider where you want to be in life, um, not in the work context, where we all want to be uh, rich and famous with the nice cars, etc. but that's not what we're talking about. Consider your health, consider what life you want to live in retirement. Do you want a slow life, do you want to live at the beach? Things like that, uh, life goals, right? Project your thoughts positively, you know, reinforce uh, yourself to think, I want to see my daughter at the end of the work day. I want to come home and I can't wait till my dog jumps on my lap, right? And, and eventually you start to rewire your brain uh, through the notion of if I can do X uh, because of Y, uh, I should be able to do the next task. And then ultimately it is to understand what you can and cannot influence. Uh, you can't change the weather. You can't change the fact that um, somebody hit, drove into your car, but how you react to these circumstances is in your control. So try and be cognizant of things like that. And then what helped me greatly to achieve calmness and to unplug after work is meditation. So um, I've been using an app, uh, Headspace, uh, that takes you through some guided meditations uh, to help you learn how to meditate. Uh, and it's, it's been great because for 10 to 15 minutes, I sit there in a quiet room and my brain is literally off. It's a flat line. You don't actually hear a thought and it's great. And once you achieve that scene, you can start unpacking some of your problems. Um, and and start coming up with solutions. All right. So the next is also to keep a journal. Um, so for example, I use an app called Dailyo. Uh, that is a mood tracker, and it prompts me three times throughout the day. What is my mood like? Am I like woohoo party party? Am I all right or am I depressed? You know, you you don't want to be yo-yoing between those states. That's the indication that something's not right. You want to be constant. And these apps provide good insight into um, adding additional data to these capture points. So you can say, uh, I'm feeling sad. And then you can say, what was I doing? Well, I had a fight with my friend. And then you can eventually review the states and say, well, it, I see quite a few red marks on my graph. What was I doing? And then you can avoid those behaviors going forward and structure your life as such. So. 
I see that I'm running out of time a little bit, um, but I think I should be fine. But ultimately, you need to eliminate distractions in your life. It is very easy in today's day and age to um, not be caught by screens um, or, or other obligations. Uh, I'm sure the people with families know that you know, your attention is split between ensuring your household is running, ensuring your family is running, ensuring your social life is running, ensuring work is running, and ensuring that you're healthy, right? So you need to just limit social media. That stuff's addictive and it's bad for you. Set aside focus time. Um, set aside time in your diary for lunch. That's a big one. Nobody knows, everybody knows not to call me at 12 because I'm showering. And you know, that rule break is very important. And then set boundaries. Like I said, you know, people know not to phone me at 12 for half an hour. It's I'm showering. I might not actually be, I might have a sandwich and walk around the house a little bit, but it's my time and you've got to have your time. All right. So just focus on or be aware of what can be a distractor in your life and set boundaries, um, but also be adaptable ultimately. So next, I just want to touch on um, basically, you know, you need to find your normal. Not everybody is the same and your routine may be slightly different, but ultimately every human needs self-care, social interactions. Unfortunately, we can't get around having to work. And uh, you need to practice self-awareness by uh, introspecting and adapting your behavior and essentially measuring yourself, right? And that all enables you to ensure that with the stages that you aren't going down the rabbit hole. So next, I, I just, this is very important and dear to me, there are a lot of resources to help you if you are in a situation like this. Um, in terms of mental health, burnout and depression can be quite similar. Um, and being depressed for a very long time can also lead to burnout. Okay. So uh, there's some contacts. Um, the South African uh, Depression and Anxiety Group. Uh, I will post the slide into the chat after this for anybody that would like to uh, see it. Um, but ultimately, for the guy of Insights, Daryl, uh, if you're facing some problems, um, you know, could it be a loss in your life? Uh, is working from home during lockdown getting to you? Have you been putting in 24 hours a day for a week? You know, Alison Palmer, our head of HR, is an absolutely wonderful lady. Um, she is very receptive and aware of what people go through and she has a heart of gold so she is always available and she's also um provided basically some of this uh, material here to basically say she is available she has an open door policy you can discuss anything with her um Daryl does have a psychologist that uh, you can be referred to considering uh, what you may be going through and confidentiality is guaranteed um People close in the organization may have known through my burnout, but before this, uh, I think only Alison and some of the executives would have known about it. There's no problem too big or small, okay? Uh, approach people that you feel comfortable with. And also, I encourage the team leads to please punt mental health. Check in with your guys. If you know one guy is constantly working, ask why. Are, are you dividing labor incorrectly? Or are they, you know, going down the stages of uh, burnout? Make health your priority in your own life and your own team. And lastly, I just wanted to tell you what some of the tools are, just to reiterate uh, what I've been using. So uh, these are apps, uh, Calm and Headspace. Um, in terms of sleep aids, uh, Calm is quite nice. It can play some white noise or rustling bushes or even uh, read your bedtime story and then mood and events tracking um, there's apps like dailyo or you can just use a good old-fashioned mood journal the reason i like an app is because you can filter data quite quickly and see very unique uh, things in, in your mental health and ultimately uh, i would just like to end up in saying that Mental health, you know, is is unfortunately uh, 
and well, fortunately, very, very crucial to your being. Uh, without your mind, you are nothing. Um, also, during this time of COVID, there's been a lot of focus on mental health and ensuring that you know you do not uh, burn the candle at both ends, that you log off at the correct time after work. Um, so, in that vein, please, you know, take yourself, ensure that you are leading a healthy life, and if you do ever need to reach out to somebody. Please know that uh, there are structures in place uh, outside of the company and inside the company to assist you with anything. Uh, and I would like to thank you for your time uh, in this presentation. Thank you so much, Jürgen. I think that might be one of the most important talks that we will have throughout our time at the conference. And I know that we have a lot of important talks that we deal with, but mental health is certainly something that historically has been stigmatized and really needs to be in the open to allow people to get the help they need. I wanted to just ask on a point that you made, just in terms of managing those automatic negative thoughts that might come up throughout a day when you do check in with yourself, how do you deal with those sorts of moments where things are feeling a bit overwhelmed and you find yourself reverting back to old patterns? How do you manage that? That's, that's a very good question. And I think um, where you restate uh, what is valuable for you, you should uh, actually, um, it's, it's something that they do in the effect, uh, seven habits of highly effective people is you write down your values on a little card and you keep it with you. Uh, and that is a nice crutch to have to basically you know, you might have these negative th thoughts saying, I'm garbage, I'm garbage. And you can refer back to that saying, hey, look, you know, I'm not. I've got a healthy, amazing family. Uh, I've got a great job. Um, you know, I make people laugh. I'm a friend to somebody. I have friends. Uh, these thoughts are temporary. So it's, it's this ha di having a dialogue with yourself. And if you do feel overwhelmed, please reach out and speak to somebody. Absolutely. And for the tools that you shared, we will also reshare them on all of our platforms. This talk is recorded and we will be reiterating all of the support tools in all of the various media where we are releasing this specifically on YouTube and on LinkedIn. And it will also be, be made available within Daryl on Teams and Stream and on Yammer. If you need help, please reach out to people. To everybody who's joined us today, Thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your lunch. I hope that this was informative and interesting, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next session. We will be releasing the event and the recording for the event quite soon. Keep an eye out on our various social portals for that. If you do have questions or if you have a suggestion that you'd like to add on, please feel free to also complete the little feedback survey that we will be sending out quite shortly as well. It helps us to improve our experience and it helps us to make sure that we get to talk about important things. So thank you so much, Wesley, for sharing that really interesting information around how we should manage the identities in an organization, the importance of doing that. We've learned a lot today in terms of cybersecurity and on a slightly more personal note, on how to actually take care of ourselves and our well-being. So for now, thank you for joining us. We will see you guys very shortly in the next session. And until then, stay safe and take care of yourself. Bye.